All right, we're live. All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're glad to have this conversation um, with Maggie Dennis and some other folks from Community of Resilience and Sustainability. So, and then Emerald, if it's easier, we can take the slide down and then Maggie can just pop on and be her lovely magnanimous self. <laughs> Yeah, I can't live up to that. No pressure, me. Maggie. Sorry. <laughs> All right, go for it, Maggie. Let's see. Let's hear who you are and what you do. Hello, everybody. I'm Maggie Dennis, the Vice President of Community Resilience and Sustainability at the Foundation. Um, I've been at the Foundation for 11 years, I think, and in the movement for uh, some years before that as an editor on English Wikipedia. Uh, the teams that I oversee lead uh, trust and safety, human rights operations, um, community development, movement strategy, and governance, and I bet I'm forgetting somebody, committee support. So uh, anyway, a lot of stuff here, plus I have connections with people all across the foundation, so I do have a little bit of insight. Um, this is an opportunity for people to, to talk to me about things that interest them. I'm very nervous. I'm always nervous. My mother keeps telling me that I shouldn't tell you that, but as soon as I do, I feel better. So sorry, mom, I hate to let you down. Anyway, um, I appreciate those of you who are dialing in and also those who have come into the Zoom call with us. Uh, we have some pre-submitted questions, which Jackie will be presenting, and we will be getting to the live questions as well. What we don't get to now, uh, we will attempt to, to, well, we won't attempt to, we will follow up in writing. We always have. We're not going to stop now. Also, uh, when I get nervous, I'm inclined to speak quickly. Those of you who are able to follow along in my language, because I don't know yours, I appreciate it. I apologize in advance. If I get too fast, just tell me and I will slow down. Okay, Jackie, over to you. All right. Well, thanks, Maggie. And just as Maggie had said, please speak up, yell at us something if we are speaking too quickly because some of us are native English speakers. So please just let us know and we will be mindful and slow down. And please pardon my interruption if you are speaking and I um, ask you to slow down a little bit. I do not intend to be rude or throw off your thought. I just want to make sure that we are all connecting together. Uh, so hi, everyone. I am Jackie Kerner. I am the community, uh, communication specialist uh, for community resilience and sustainability. That's a tongue twister for me. Um, so with me in the room, like I said, we have several staff members who are also available to uh, answer the questions and also magnanimous Maggie. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to hear a lot from these folks who are leading these projects and involved. And we also have a member of the Movement Charter Drafting Committee in the room uh, to offer some insights um, on any questions around that work. So if you are in the Zoom room, we'd love your participation please feel free to raise your hand to ask a question or uh, do this little thing that I put in the chat, uh, circle with a slash to show your hand is raised and I will put you in the queue. And that might take a minute um, because we also are taking questions from YouTube and from Telegram as well. Uh, so um, a Zoom room is the name of um, my dog's playground. Well, there you go, Zoom room. So this might be that fun, we're not sure. Um, so uh, please ask questions wherever you are. Could be here in the Zoom room, could be on Telegram, could be on YouTube, and also on the Movement Strategy Forum as well. Uh, we have some eyes on that thread where I posted uh, Maggie's uh, com conversation hour. So please um, ask those questions. And if you have questions that come up afterwards, Again, just reach out and we'll either ask those after um, and find out what Maggie thinks or other folks think and get those answers back to you. Notes will be published in about a week. So just some fun things that we're gonna go over. Uh, again, speak slowly. And I'd like to acknowledge that um, this is a safe space for everyone. The Universal Code of Conduct does cover this, uh, this area. So let's um, discuss some hard topics, but let's be respectful and mindful of each other as we discuss them. So let's get started with the fun. Um, Maggie, I'll go ahead and start with some of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. 
Uh, see, so first on the list, um, I heard about what is going on in some parts of the world with the arrests of Wikipedia editors. People in my community are a bit scared by this news. Do you have any resources or guidance for us? Well, um, we, we do have uh, some resources on the meta page for the human rights team that may be helpful to people, uh, particularly who want information on, on digital security. And there's more information on the online learning platform related to digital security. And of course, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, it would be helpful if somebody could paste the question in the chat too, because I, when I'm nervous, I sometimes forget what was asked. <laughs> so uh, I, I, guidance for you. Yes, resources are guidance for you. Um, it's really important, I think, for all of us to be aware of the context in which we're working. Uh, we, we work in many different contexts around the world and we're each subject to different risks. Sometimes those risks may not be obvious. Uh, shortly after I first started editing Wikipedia as a volunteer, I found myself targeted by a neo-Nazi group um, of English Wikipedia users who were trying to, to do things that I was trying to stop them to do from my position on vandalism patrol. But so even being, you know, an American user on English Wikipedia, I still found myself targeted by a group that might have actually had resources to bring against me, although they eventually just wandered away. But um, I've spoken to an individual recently who was in an area of the world that they would have largely regarded as safe for, for sharing free knowledge. And uh, now suddenly they aren't. So um, I think that it's pretty important for all of us to consider what not only what our current environment is, but what our environment might be. Certainly the United States has changed in its approach to free information sharing in the time I've been an editor. And um, I, I think, I think we really need to be careful when we're engaging in high uh, sensitivity delicacy topics, not to assume that because it's safe now, it will always be so. And I think it's important for people to remember that um, sharing knowledge is, is really important, but we can do it in, in safe ways. And that it's not just our safety we're thinking about, but the safety of our loved ones, our friends, our families. When, when we are engaging in provocative online behavior, uh, even if we're, and when I say provocative, I don't mean to imply we're doing anything wrong. You know, sharing information that, that other people want to censor is not doing anything wrong, but it, it can attract really unwelcome attention. Um, I hope that, yeah, uh, I'm, you know, if, if it's not putting you on the spot, uh, Risker, might I ask you to uh, speak to that? And I know also many, many years ago, uh, I talked to you about being on uh, an arbitration committee uh, because you were, and you shared with me that this is not a necessarily safe thing to do even in the English Wikipedia community. So if you don't mind speaking to the essay, I think that's, that's helpful. Happy to do so. Um, a long time ago, for reasons that escape me now, because but because it's occurred so often on so many of our projects, uh, a colleague and I wrote this essay about uh, Wikipedia being in the real world and having to be aware that your actions are political. They are very public. They are very clearly available to the world to see what you are up to. And if you have reasons to believe that your actions or your edits uh, or the things that you post on a talk page may be, may cause you problems in your real life, you need to really think about this. Uh, this is something that really does happen. Um, back in the million years ago, and uh, Maggie and I were talking about arbitration committees at the time it was extremely popular for uh individuals and groups to go out and actively seek out uh personal information about arbitrators uh very prolific administrators very prolific editors and use it for harassment uh it's common it, it has been commonplace for many years it's not as bad now and i think part of it is the willingness of 
the Wikimedia Foundation and other parts of our global community to step up and say, no, this is not okay. Uh, it's not acceptable. And if you're going to behave in this way, you don't need to be here. Uh, and there have been many examples recently of much more recently of people being removed from all projects being globally banned for that. But that doesn't have any effect on whether or not a government is going to look at your edits, whether or not they're going to, uh, your employer is going to look at your edits. Uh, your family could look at your edits, uh, especially if they know that you edit Wikipedia. Uh, so keep these things in, you know, it is important for people to keep these things in mind is that every time you're publishing, it's it can be considered a political statement. Uh, even if you are just correcting a typographical error, somebody is going to go back and say, see, he edited that particularly sensitive topic. There's an edit, <laughs> you know, even if it was just a typo. Uh, right now, the Arbitration Committee on English Wikipedia is looking at a case where some of the evidence that people are being, are promoting a certain agenda is based on diffs where the differential the diffs are absolutely benign but it's the fact that they have edited the article that is being called out and that's a big problem for everybody we all have to be conscious of the fact that it's not just areas of the world that are have a well-known political sensitivities and well-known censorious governments. It can be academia. It can be happening on English Wikipedia. It can be happening on every single main, major language Wikipedia, even though most of those are Western languages with a fair amount of protection for the individuals in sharing knowledge. So we need to think about that. I'm complete. Well, thank you for Risker for going over that. And um, this this is a very interesting topic area again. So thank you for for sharing the information um, that you all have. And um, Cameron had also posted a link in the chat to um, some digital security resources. So please, everyone, um, with curiosity, please check that out. All right, I will move on to the next question um, in the interest of time. So thank you um, again to everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. Um, so the question is, I know you won't talk about the specific cases, but the recent uh, action in the Middle East, North Africa uh, area and all the press attention, I think it might have been better if you did. Uh, what I'm asking here is why don't you talk about specific cases and would you ever? Well, I mean, I could talk for quite some time about that, so I won't. I'll try to keep it succinct um, and, and can follow up if I don't get to the heart of the matter. Um, the risks of doing the wrong thing, of saying the wrong thing can be pretty severe. And uh, while we have tried to be a little less guarded when we're talking about um, say cases that involve larger groups of people, even with that, we have been informed of, of potential negative consequences to the people um, who are involved. Um, I'm very aware that there's a tension between our movements, um, our movement's dedication to transparency, which I, I, those of you who know me know that I tend to talk way more than I should and sometimes say more than I should. But um, it's, it's also really important for me to remember that you can't take back when you say the wrong thing. And when you're saying the wrong thing and it may, it may result in somebody being targeted in a way that is physically dangerous for them or could result in the loss of their freedom, that's a pretty big mistake. Uh, that that is very difficult to take back. So all I can really say is we will continue to explore um, in every case we deal with the benefits of of open communication. When when we are when when we're doing an action that is based around protection, we will sometimes work with the individuals who are at risk. 
to make sure that we are working within their comfort levels. Sometimes we work with um, people who are representing them, like attorneys, uh, family members, if we are not able to reach them directly. Um, and you know, we're, we're lucky our human rights operations team for whom the, the lead is here, Cameron, um, are really good at helping us stay aware of the risks for, for specific individuals in, in specific situations. And it, it is just an area where I think we have to default to caution. Um, at the same time, I want to be able to talk more about the general kinds of cases we see, because I think if people don't know what sorts of things can go wrong, they don't understand how to avoid them or what we can do as a movement to address them because there is no one body in the Wikimedia movement that can provide safety for all of us. Uh, not the foundation, not anybody. We all need to work together on this. So as much as possible, I, I'd like to stay dedicated to talking about these kinds of challenges and working collectively to resolve them. Um, I just have to do it with extreme sensitivity and be careful that I don't say too much. All right, well, thanks, Maggie. Well, here's a related question. Uh, what is the foundation doing to protect volunteers from these kinds of threats? Um, so I know you, you care a lot about this. Um, so this is something that we're, we all think about quite often. Well, um, I will start by saying, um, as I mentioned, Cameron is our human rights lead and um, he's been under the weather. So I don't know if he wants to come on camera and speak, but it looks like he does. Cameron, do you wanna say a few words to that? Sure, thanks Maggie. And thank you for the really, uh, really great and thoughtful question. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very important thing uh, uh, to be asking. Uh, forgive me, there's another meeting going on in, in my, house right now. So you might hear dueling voices. So if anything's not unclear, uh, please feel free to ask me to repeat uh, because I want to be sure that everything is clear. So um, the foundation is taking a number of steps. Um, you know, there's a, it's a global movement and a global platform. So there's diverse risks around the world from different cultures, different, different uh, jurisdictions and so on. So one of the important things is to, is to be thinking from the bottom up, so to speak, not from the top down. And this means that working with local communities and understanding how to approach their you know, concerns in a, in a way that makes sense for them. Um, as Maggie mentioned earlier, as I, and as, as I shared earlier, and again, I can post the link again, um, we have a digital, digital security resources page that anybody can access. We've recently uh, launched a, a learn.wiki. I always want to say wiki.learn, a learn.wiki digital security course and digital security assessment that individuals can take in order for them to actually you know, test themselves. Um, the human rights team uh, is available and partners with various communities to conduct digital security trainings or assessments or to work with individuals and communities, you know, with their digital security risks. And we also actively talk with members of the community to get a sense of what's going on. Because in my work in human rights, you know, since 2009, I think it's, it's really important to be able to feel and understand uh, what people are going through, you know, closer to actually what's happening rather than take, take a top uh, down approach. Um, so we're engaged in that, what I call, I like to call active listening around that and active responding around that and being able to you know, tailor our responses and our concerns uh, with to these different communities needs. So hopefully that answers some of the questions. So basically, you know, we are do doing trainings. Uh, we have you know, an actively and regularly updated list of digital security resources that we're translating, regular that, we, that is, has been translated to a number of languages and we'll be translating more. We have one course launch, which is a pilot course. We're hoping to launch some more courses that might focus on different aspects of digital security so that we could actually help uh, community members, you know, sort of narrow in rather than on a high level on uh, specific aspects of digital security. And then we also want to launch a co uh, course on, on Wiki digital security, something more focused specifically to Wikipedia, uh, in addition to having a better overall digital hygiene. And again, we're always open to email, to, to being contacted via email if you'd like to work with us, uh, you know, and I'll paste that in the chat in just a moment. All right, well, thank you for that. And uh, in interest of time, uh, I think we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, uh, thanks for sharing the email address, uh, Cameron, in the chat. Uh, so if anyone needs to get in contact, um, there's the email. 
Um, the next question, Maggie, I noticed Natalia's email about postponing AFCOM elections and the foundation affiliate strategy. What are the next steps? Um, the next steps. Uh, so uh, Natalia is working with a consultant who is helping her pull together conversations with affiliate uh, leaders, with some staff, with AFCOM um, to basically begin uh, understanding what people are thinking, what they are seeing. And so that's that's where she is right now. It's it's a learning journey. And uh, frankly, we're all learning the next steps right along as the community does. Uh, staff is supporting her on this, but um, this is not a staff led program. We are a staff supporting this. Um, Jack, do you have anything to add? Otherwise known as Zeno. I think you got that about right. I, I did have a chance to meet with the consultant today. He's asking the right questions and he's trying to kind of get different perspectives from uh, those various stakeholder groups that you mentioned. And uh, yeah, Maggie, introduce me. I'm Jack, sometimes known as Zeno, and I'm the uh, senior committee support manager uh, that supports the affiliations committee. So I'm helping move this work forward. Hi, well, thanks for that. And I am guessing we will look forward to hearing more in the future. Um, so uh, next question that we have, and I apologize for moving so quickly. I just see how time is ticking away and we have so many brilliant questions. I want to make sure that they're all asked. Um, so this one here has some uh, different parts. Uh, the vote just closed on the enforcement guidelines and it had more support than last time. What's next? Well, um, uh, the board is convening uh, in March for their their regular meeting and they will be looking at it. And I assume that they will then be directing us to move forward or not. And uh, we will move forward or not. Uh, based on the outcomes, I rather imagine we will be moving forward and uh, beginning to build the systems. I mean, some, of the, some of the systems like the software support have already been underway, but things like uh, BU4C will need to be built. And we got to get moving on that because our commitment is a year after everything closes to say, how's it working? Is it is the policy fit for purpose? Is the approach fit for purpose? And uh, it'll be really helpful if we can tell. So the goal is to get it all up and running and then come back to it and say, is it right or is it not? All right, and the second part to this question, Maggie, does it bother you that some community members are still calling for a vote uh, for the policy to consider it official? Um, uh, no, it doesn't bother me, um, per se. I, I, uh, I understand that it is very difficult for, it's very difficult for people to figure out the best ways to coordinate governance on a community scale as large as ours. Uh, that's why we have like the movement strategy and governance team. I feel like it's very important for people to be involved in helping make decisions that impact them. So I get that uh, that for some people, the fact that there wasn't a, a vote or a review process, because some people don't like the term vote, on the uh, first part, the policy makes it feel less comfortably like it was approved by the community. Um, I think it would be a mistake for us to slow down progress. I think that uh, at this point, we, we, we have a history as, as a movement of wanting perfection. Um, I mean, I'm speaking from my, my perspective here as a Wikimedian of many years on English Wikipedia. I remember, and those of you from English Wikipedia probably also do, that we have closed down so many forums for addressing behavioral concerns. Uh, and we always close them down, like the uh, etiquette notice board, uh, user comment. We always say, we're going to figure out a better way. And then we never do. So I think it's important for us to get trying and get moving. So it doesn't bother me. I understand it. Um, but I, I think we can't afford to, to just keep waiting and waiting. I think we really need to try stuff, figure out what works and doesn't, and keep going. Oh, well, thank you for the answer. Um, then the uh, final question of this question, uh, why would you run a vote uh, on any of this, including the one just closed, when voting is not the community way? 
Um, well, uh, what we just ran, I mean, I know it's it's weird. And, and uh, years ago, I as a staff member, I facilitated a conversation about the logo for one of our projects. And I was combining people from different uh, language communities. And the reaction I got was, we must have a vote. And we can't have a vote based on what language community they were from. So not every community feels the same about voting. And this is a surprise for those who come from communities who feel strongly about it. Um, but it was, it was an, it, it's, a, it's a poll. It is a poll to understand how many people thought it was fit for purpose and more importantly, to gather data about why or why not so that we could see what problems there were. Um, I mean, there's always unintended consequences when you create new policies. And any one of you who've ever worked on a policy on Wikipedia has undoubtedly seen this in action. Um, and we hoped to be able to surface some of those consequences before we got to the trial and error by asking people their opinions. And I think based on the results of the survey, um, I think that worked. Uh, because the support was much stronger after the, the second round of conversations addressed the problems that were raised the first time. Um, Stella, as trust and safety policy manager, do you have anything you want to add or? You know, I was thinking about it while you were giving your incredible answer and I have no notes. Um, I, the only thing I could add on is I want to give a big thank you and big ups. Big ups means thank you, but extra to everyone who helped on this really long journey to cross this milestone. I've been at the foundation for about two years and all two years of that were spent working on the UCOC, which I refer to internally as my favorite thing. Um, definitely wanna give a big thank you to our volunteer led drafting committee, the folks who weighed in on the talk pages and the voters. Um, one of the things that the team prioritizes and I prioritize is reading and going through all of the feedback. So I wanna say thank you to everyone who's weighed in so far or will weigh in in the future, but nothing to add from Maggie's very, very well summarized points. All right, well, thank you both for that. And again, I just wanna mirror that. Thanks everyone who participated uh, on the various parts of the process. All right, our next question, oh, this is a tough one. Um, recently, it was discovered that a staff member had canvassed uh, participation about an RFC on English Wikipedia. Why would that happen? And what are you doing about it? Um, okay, uh, so for those of you who don't know, yes, this was recently discovered. It was um, uh, brought to the foundation's attention by the English Wikipedia's Arbitration Committee, which we greatly appreciated. And uh, uh, the product and technology team have been addressing it. Uh, Selena, who is the chief of product and technology has spoken about it on English Wikipedia. So for those of you who don't no, there's a conversation on English Wikipedia right now about whether or not the recent Vector 2022 release should be default. Um, and one of the staff members working on this felt like it would be useful to get input from people who have design experience and attempted to do so in a way that would not uh, violate canvassing approaches. However, um, it was a mistake. You know, I, I don't feel comfortable speaking about personnel issues. It was a mistake. And part of that I think arises from the fact that uh, there's a lot of nuance in working with, with international communities and different policies and approaches. And uh, it can be hard to not only onboard people fully, but to keep them up to date on their training to remind them. I don't know about you, but when I was onboarded to my job, there was plenty of things they told me that I forgot 10 minutes later because they told me so many things all in one go and uh, training has to be ongoing. So um, I, think, I think I can say that it is, there's, there's a lot of need to make sure that we keep people aware, not only of what the policies and guidelines are, but why they exist, what their purpose is, and that uh, we make sure that we take accountability when things don't go well. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you for that, for that answer. Uh, let's see, the next uh, question here, let's see. Sorry, I lost my place in the document. Uh, we had so many wonderful questions submitted. So thank you everyone for, for doing this, this wonderful uh, work to create some great conversation. Um, 
let's see. It's challenging for user groups to get registered as nonprofits with tax exempt benefits in my country, which is a prerequisite for formal affiliation. What can we do to function as formal movement bodies? Okay, I'll paste this one in the chat as well. Oh, hold on. There we go. Well, um, that one uh, falls outside of my uh, current uh, work areas. Um, I'm going to say there's probably somebody in the room on staff who can answer that better than I can. Um, do I have any volunteers? I think I can probably handle that one, Maggie. I, I don't see a lawyer in the room. Maybe there's a lawyer in the room, but I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I like to prefix with that. Um, so just a Quick reintroduc reintroduction, I'm Jack um, with the committee support team. So our team works with movement committees, including uh, the affiliations committee. And this question, there's kind of two parts to it. Uh, so it's, it's about user groups who need to register as a nonprofit uh, in order to become uh, a chapter or a thematic organization. And then there is sometimes an expectation to have a tax exemption. Uh, so they, the questioner didn't specify their country. So I'm just going to answer the tax, ex, tax exempt, exempt status first. Uh, and, and basically, there's a, a misunderstanding here. Tax exempt status is only required for US-based uh, organizations. Uh, the second part of the question is that it's difficult registering. So that could be whether the questioner is from the US or maybe just having difficulty registering a nonprofit in general. Uh, and that question, I can confirm that uh, the Affiliations Committee Charter does, uh, does include, uh, let me just see, uh, connecting affiliates with each other for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing and directing affiliates to participate in the Wikimedia Movement's various capacity building programs. So I'd say this is like a, a knowledge sharing uh, opportunity here. So if, if someone is having trouble registering a nonprofit uh, or registering a nonprofit with tax exempt status, then they should reach out to the affiliations committee or, or my team to help coordinate with the affiliations committee. Uh, and I know that there is a number of, um, of capacity building programs that are in place right now thinking uh, about Let's Connect, which is a place where grantees can go to share, uh, share knowledge. So Let's Connect might be a really good uh, venue to kind of help people, hey, this is how you register a nonprofit. Uh, this is how you get tax exempt status. This is my contact at the IRS. Don't tell them I sent you something like that. Uh, anyways, reach out for help if, if you really want to kind of move to that next level. Uh, however, it's it's only uh, the tax exempt is only a requirement in the US. And uh, the nonprofit is, is generally pretty straightforward that, that you can get help with that. Thanks for the, the time to talk about this. Uh, thank you for that. That is um, a, a long process. It can be a longer process. And um, thank you, uh, Zeno, for going over that information. So, all right. So the next question, ooh, the next question I'm going to ask um, is about a recent article. Um, there was a recent article about Holocaust denialism on Wikipedia. What is the purpose of your disinformation team? How are they helping with situations like that? So I'll paste that question in the chat. I don't suppose any of you want to know my favorite ice cream. Anyway, uh, sorry, I'm just joking because this is such a heavy session. We are talking about some deep stuff. Um, okay, yes, it does have uh, somebody posted in chat. It probably has caramel. It does indeed. So Holocaust denialism on Wikipedia. All right. Um, one thing I bet all Wikimedians know is that uh, misinformation and disinformation is our daily bread. Um, we are trying to put together factual information in a world that argues about every fact. Uh, we are trying to, I mean, I know people are gonna immediately out there saying, it's about verifiability, not truth. But uh, the reason why we wanted to be verifiable is because we wanted to be factual. So I say, I get the last word because it's my meeting. I can see somebody's eyebrows furrowing, but I, I disagree. Um, okay, so since the time I started on, on um, 
on Wikimedia, I have, uh, I've run into this. I mean, there are partisan arguments about just about everything as to what should be included. Now, um, I think that our communities do an excellent job of, of dealing with this. When, when the systems that we've, we've created as Wikimedians work, um, they are amazing in terms of keeping content neutral, keeping it clear. Those of us who edit or who have edited, because I'm kind of slack in that regard, uh, all know that it is possible to be worn down because there are people who continue to push a certain angle, push a certain line. And if the community is not able to rally around to defend a certain topic, uh, it can be really hard to keep information accurate. Uh, usually we do the best we can to flag such issues with labels, um, and there are tireless new page patrollers and recent change editors uh, all across the movement who are, are working to avoid issues. So in terms of the Holocaust denialism, uh, while I don't know a ton about that because I'm not involved in uh, the article, I wasn't myself consulted about it. Um, I do know that it, it doesn't surprise me to hear that a particularly political topic would be an embattled area. Uh, I've seen it. I've, I mean, I remember one of the biggest arguments I ever was ever called into was on the history of uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream flavors. And it's like, of course, they're going to fight about something that's really critically important. Um, in terms of the purpose of the disinformation team, uh, I've got uh, Jan Eisfeld in the room, who is the uh, global head of trust and safety, um, and he can speak a little bit more to what the disinformation team is doing and how they help with such situations. Although I will have to remind you all, not allowed to talk about specific situations. So even Jan knows this better than I do. He's not as, as loose-lipped as I am. So Jan, go ahead. Yeah, thank you kindly. And good evening, everybody. So the basics, I think Maggie covered really well. This is an ongoing challenge for all of our communities. Has been forever. But also, and I think this is crucial, is increasingly intense, increasingly intense on larger projects, on smaller projects, and on very small projects as well. But that's also where sometimes the similarities end. So one of the three key purposes of the disinformation team is to help to explore and understand what these challenges are in the specific circumstances and what the local community respectively um, has already in place in order to address challenges of this nature. So for example, the case Maggie just talked about has a well-regarded and quite strong track record um, institutional arrangement with a local body that can review really complicated cases. Most of our communities don't have that. Um, now these, bodies or other community structures, depending on the community, may well have needs as they're encouraging and trying to work through really complicated issues or quite often issues in which they don't have the language capabilities or that touch upon very specific topic areas that are very far outside um, their particular individual expertise, or if it's a body, um, their collective expertise as a group entrusted by the local community to solve really difficult things. Um, in that case, basically the second layer kicks in, which is the disinformation team becoming a hub of skills and complementary support that these uh, community processes can access and say, hey, you know, we are looking at this piece of information. For example, uh, we had a case like this uh, late last year where Hindi language material was really important to a local community that tried to solve a very delicate, complicated problem. But no one who was working on that in that local community spoke that language and the machine translations didn't get to this very fine point they were trying to work out that was important to the local process. So we could help with that, for example. Um, and then there is a third layer, which is as communities go about their hobby business of curating uh, and disseminating knowledge, something risk asset is really important, which is, it is happening out in the world, not only in the interactions that we have with each other. So communities go through cycles where they have heightened risk 
that they are facing as individuals, but also as communities more broadly. Uh, be that national elections, for example, where local communities come under more pressure or geopolitical events uh, where this team also alongside um, legal and the human rights team plays a leading role in helping individuals and helping the community at large to navigate uh, successfully those challenges. So there are really three layers to this, but it starts consistently from the lens that every community has different needs. So there is no one approach that would be deployed for all communities. I'm done. All right, well, thank you, Jan, for that. And thanks, Maggie, for starting us off. And everyone, please remember, you're welcome to answer questions. Or, sorry, answer questions. Go for it. Uh, <laughs> if you have the answers, please bring them. Uh, you're able to ask questions uh, live. So share them on YouTube, uh, Telegram, the Movement Strategy Forum, or here in the Zoom room. You're welcome to ask them live. Or if you feel more comfortable, just paste them in the chat. That's welcome as well. I'll go ahead and move on to the next pre-submitted question while we are waiting for you to find the questions or answers. Uh, so how are the true advantages of movement strategy grant proposal measured once, it's, once it is received and finalized, especially for funds that focus on specific skill development and community improvement? How is the improvement evaluated and assured? That's a long one, so I'll paste that in the chat. Thank you. Um, for fortunately, uh, looking at the attendee list, I have someone in the room who can speak to this. So uh, for those of you who don't know, um, grants don't live under me. They, they live in a different department, but that's not entirely true when it comes to movement strategy grants. So uh, the Yop, can I ask you to speak? Yes, yeah, sure, Maggie. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, right, so looking at the question, um, I kind of read that bit as a two-part question. One, which is sort of around how the projects are evaluated, and the second being um, sort of potentially how the reports or the outputs or outcomes are assessed in relation to how they might impact the community. Um, so I'll try and respond to that. Um, first of all, in, in evaluations, Every movement strategy um, grant application is evaluated based on how it will impact the specific initiative that it targets, as well as the impact that it might have on the communities where it will be implemented. And this is the same, of course, for skills, um, skills development applications. Um, and, and so that's sort of how the um, um, proposals are sort of evaluated. And then um, in, also as part of that process, I guess it would be worth mentioning that um, um, proposals are usually also posted on Meta and the Movement Strategy Forum. And so community inputs and feedback um, is often also taken in, into account when evaluating a proposal that has been sent through. Um, and sometimes where that uh, public feedback is provided and it raises flags or questions, um, so we sort of, um, the process goes deeper into um, understanding those. Um, in, in the past um, year, year and a half of movement strategy grants, there's been sort of a couple of refresh rounds um, uh, on the approach. And in um, the last year, that was the first sort of intentional support and focus where focus was then put um, very heavily on skills development. Um, thanks to the community development team, of course, for helping shape that thinking. Um, and many projects that were funded since are now submitting reports. So this is sort of trying to answer the second part of the question. Um, currently, the movement strategy team is working on a learnings evaluation from these reports that are now pouring in to help us answer the questions about how these skills development projects have actually impacted the communities in relation to um, what they had proposed to do um, and the measurable impact and metrics that project teams had proposed in those um, proposals. Sometimes it happens better in sort of a bit of retrospect and refresh to help us um, sort of strengthen the approach moving forward. Full stop. Thank you, Maggie. All right, well, thank you, Yope. 
uh, for that answer. Uh, the next question relates that was pre-submitted. So I'm going to continue with that one. And then I'm going to ask Barkeep's question that was, was posted in the chat. So thanks, Barkeep, for that. I think we need a little bit of light today because um, we're asking some heavy, really heavy, intelligent, complicated questions, uh, which all are very, very critical to answer. Um, but let's answer that one last uh, or to bring it bring it home on a good note. So Maggie, this next question I have, uh, and Yope, maybe uh, this is something you'll join in on as well. Why don't volunteers from the community participate in the movement strategy grant making process? That sounds like an excellent question for Yope. I was waiting for your cue, Maggie, thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so in, in the, you know, sort of going back to something I mentioned earlier about sort of the refresh to movement strategy grants and the approach, because it's movement strategy, the approach, um, of course, is about being a little more deliberate about um, how and what projects are being implemented, but this is a really great point. The process to date um, had been or the process that we uh, sort of put in place had been for community members to support um, the development of these proposals in the first place. And this is why a community of practice was set up. Um, initially, it's um, currently on Telegram. There are perhaps uh, about 80 members, many gone silent for now. Um, but we have learned that in more intentional effort is required to make sure that community voices are reflected in that um, in that process. And so in the refresh to the approach, which is happening uh, at the moment, um, the community voices would be better reflected um, uh, with community participation in the review process and not um, only in the process of developing those proposals. So hear you on that question, makes a lot of sense. We are learning that and um, that will be reflected, um, of course, in the approach moving forward. Thank you. All right, we had some other questions come in. So um, sorry, Barkeep, I'm gonna save your question for the end. We're gonna end on a happy note. Um, so Maggie, the next, next question says, can we define the conflict of interest of people within the movement? Is there a history? How can we detect it and or avoid it if necessary? I will paste that question in the chat. Okay, um, con conflict of interest uh, typically uh, refers to when people are attempting to push something above and beyond what, what we are called to do in the movement. So, um, you know, different policies have different purposes, but somebody who's coming in to, uh, wait, no, not different policies, different projects have different purposes, sorry. Uh, people who, who go to any project, like say Wikiversity, for example, and if they are um, there to do something other than to build knowledge resources, they potentially of a conflict of interest. And not all conflicts of interest are probably, well, definitely at the same level of severity, but when a conflict of interest causes a person to undermine the intent of the projects or um, the impact of the projects or the service, then it can be a real problem. Um, many, many of our projects like, like English Wikipedia, and I think probably dozens others have conflict of interest policies that explain this better than I just did. Um, and in terms of the history, uh, yes. I mean, this is just me speculating. I've never seen data, but uh, we talked earlier about disinformation and misinformation and how difficult it is. Um, I myself have, I, I mentioned that I had some problems with uh, a uh, neo-Nazi group in the US, they had a conflict of interest. They were very interested in promoting their agenda. And uh, as an editor, I did the best that I could to make sure that the articles they were working on stayed well-sourced and neutral and met the, the policy of the project. Um, most, most of the projects have, like I said, they have some sort of, of protocols for dealing with conflict of interest. And you should follow those when you are dealing with with potential conflict of interest editing. And in terms of avoiding it, I think it's important to remember whatever the core policies are on the project you're working on and uh, an approach 
the work accordingly. If if somebody seems to be like using uh, using the, the the project inappropriately, or if they're not working in consensus, uh, it, it's it's important to pay attention to those things because uh, they can quickly subvert our intentionality. Anyway, I don't think that was super articulate, but I hope I made my point. No, oh, thank you for, for sharing that, especially about something so complicated and, and nuanced, absolutely. Um, Maggie, this next question uh, is dealing with the MCDC and maybe Risker, you'll join in on this one. Uh, what are the next steps for the movement charter discussions? When will they start working on key topics around the roles and responsibilities and the global council? Risker? I had a feeling that was coming to me. <laughs> yep. Um, to be perfectly honest, uh, we we've done we've sent out uh, three uh, chapters of the charter as early drafts for community review. So what we're doing is taking in that community response and integrating it into what uh, those early uh, chapters have are going to be. Uh, but at the same time, right now, we are starting work much more intensely on uh, roles and responsibilities, specifically on hubs and global councils. So that is our, our trajectory for uh, Q1, Q2 of uh, this year, this calendar year. Uh, we anticipate getting together in June and prep doing a, some final preparation of text. Now, how we're doing this is we're going to be reaching out to a lot of groups who have expressed, excuse me, expressed interest in talking about them. And there'll be other open forums where we're trying to collect information from other parties. We need to know what other parties are doing. Uh, we have quite a few uh, projects, uh, uh, pilots going on for hubs, for example, and we want to hear from some of the some of those pilot groups, and we want to know what's working, what isn't working, how did they focus themselves, whether or not we want to focus on some of those things. I'm working on uh, the hubs group, other. Uh, uh, committee members are working on uh, global council. We're also working on ratification. One thing that I will emphasize is that even when we get those things out there, those chapters out there for community review and response and improvement, uh, we're not going to be done yet. It's going to take quite a while still. Uh, so if people have questions about hubs or whether or not they're going to go continue on or what, that's a question that would probably best be answered by YOP um, because it's outside of our scope now. We know that we aren't going to be done for a year at least. Uh, ratification is going to come to the broad communities sometimes uh, in the future. I see, uh, what do we mean by groups? So groups are would be affiliates. They could be non-affiliated organi organized groups. We could be asking groups like uh, the stewards, what do they think? Uh, the AFCOM, what do they think? Uh, those sorts of things. We want to get a very broad perspective. And quite honestly, uh, there may be some projects that have more considered nuances and thoughts about some of these things too. Uh, have I answered the question? I'm complete. <laughs> That's a question I always ask myself. Um, uh, okay, and speaking of questions, we are close to time. There was a question in the sidebar, um, and I'm, I'm going to read it out loud unless the person who typed it wants to ask it, which relates back to the conflict of interests question. Um, what about conflict of interest of people and affiliates or staff with community members? Um, 
But, and and I, I was thinking about this once I saw it typed and I still don't have a great answer. Um, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, people, people have relationships and people have opinions and people have biases and all of us do. And uh, we have to do the best that we can to keep each other accountable, to keep each other honest and to resolve these problems when they occur. Um, in terms of what to do about it, we, we really don't yet have robust structures for working out conflicts between groups and communities. I mean, it's, it's mostly right now left to, if, if it's say, save the problems with an affiliate, it's left with the affiliate or uh, with the foundation, it's left with the foundation. And uh, we, don't, we don't have much way of working across groups to deal with these problems. I have a feeling that in the long term, hubs are going to help with this. In the immediate term, that's not like super helpful. Um, and while, I mean, there's limits to what we may be able to do. Uh, I, I think it's probably worth reaching out if there are specific issues of concern to uh, CA at wikimedia.org. Uh, so the trust and safety team can see if there's something that falls into their provenance or if not, if they can advise. I wish I had something more helpful than that to offer. Um, I like it a lot better when I can say, I have a magic solution, but I don't. <laughs> We'll keep working on it though. Jan, you have something? Specifically for, for affiliates, while of course, as Maggie has rightly said, there is no, the Wikimedia Foundation can solve your problem mechanism in general. Uh, the foundation did put out um, guidance on how in general affiliates can think about conflict of interest and how to manage them all the way back in 2014. Uh, it's called the conflict of interest guide for Wikimedia movement organizations and is available on Meta. Uh, people who have been around quite that long uh, may remember the conversations uh, community members had with both this team as well as Jeff, the general counsel at the time, about haggling about the specific practical examples. So if one encounters a situation like that, and quite often in the small group that is encountering it, it's really hard to find common ground because you know it's personal. People try to do the right thing, uh, but there's the other issue and one's not necessarily quite sure how the other think about it. Uh, just having something written down that has been looked at for a very long time is sometimes helpful. And there are all sorts of weird treasures on Meta. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is one of them that's sometimes helpful in this particular context. Uh, thank you, Jan. And I know we are at time, so I'm going to very, very quickly answer Barkeep's question before I pass it over to Jackie to say goodbye. Barkeep asked what I am most proud of in the space since the last time we had one of these office hours. I have a terrible memory for when things happened, so hopefully I won't mention anything that happened before the office hour. Um, we've already talked about the UCOC. It was a moment of sheer elation when I found out that it had so much more support this time because that made me feel like all the effort that went into refining it was worthwhile. Uh, I, I want also to note, um, Simone is in the room. I don't have time to ask her to speak, but she is the head of our community development team. And the learning platform is now open. Anyone can take courses available on it. Uh, I have long had a dream, even though I know this is a little charged this term of having a kind of Coursera of the Wikiverse where people can go and learn what they need instead of us having to recreate it. I mean, I once wrote the policy on English Wikipedia or the guideline for how to delete images because I had to know how and there wasn't one. Um, wouldn't it be great if there was one? Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I was extremely excited about the meeting we had in November with the Elections Committee and the Board Governance Committee to talk about how we can do elections better in the future. Uh, we had a lot of rough spots with the last one, including figuring out who was responsible for what, how much time people were supposed to put in. And I'm really hopeful that the next go around, it will be just a better, smoother process for everybody. And um, before I pass it to Jackie to say goodbye, thank you for everybody who came and especially for those of you who joined me on Zoom because seeing your friendly faces really does make this less scary for me. If there are questions we didn't get to, we'll, we'll do them in writing. But Jackie, if you could do the outro. Yes. 
So thank you everyone for joining live and thank you everyone for watching the recording after if that's what you are doing. Uh, these questions that were answered live will have the notes published. I'll try to do that in about a week. Uh, we'll see how things go, but hopefully about a week I'll have those posted and any questions like Maggie said uh, that were not able to be answered during the call. We will pass those on to the proper folks to provide an answer and hopefully get that back to you soon and look forward to seeing you all at the next one. Okay. Thanks everyone. Bye. I see you all Bye. Soon. Bye. Bye. Maybe we should try to do like a Wikipedia.